So I'll talk about my PhD project and I'm very happy to be able to introduce it today. Um, it's about induced pluripotent stem cells um, of the Pura syndrome and I'll introduce you to the technique a little more in depth. So that's what I will talk about today. So first of all, I'll talk about the properties of stem cells. So what are stem cells? What can they do? Um, what are their key features? And why do we use them? Or why can we use them? Then I'll talk, I'll, in I'll introduce you to induced pluripotent stem cells, which are um, a very, very nice technique, in my opinion, um, to study diseases like the Pura syndrome. And uh, then I'll talk about Pura iPSCs, basically the application of this technique for Pura syndrome. And I'll end up with uh, how we can generate a disease model using these iPSCs and a little outlook, what is going to come in the future. So what are stem cells? And what are their properties? So um, in general, stem cells have two key features, um, which are that they are um, immortal, meaning that they can self-renew um, for an unlimited time, um, and therefore generate copies of themselves throughout our lives in our bodies. And they can differentiate, meaning they can um, become essentially all kinds of the human body, all kinds of cells in the human body, meaning they can become, like as depicted here, uh, skin cells, liver cells, or brain cells. And the two properties combined are very promising or very relevant in our for our bodies because um, the cells, the stem cells can make copies of themselves that then differentiate to become specialized cells like skin cells, which you, for example, you, you know that we, we you, you lose continuously the, the mo outermost layer of our skin cells. And obviously those kind of cells need to be replaced. And there it's where stem cells come into the bigger picture because they copy themselves and then make themselves to, pe to become a skin cell to replace these kind of cells. And this is true for all the tissues basically in the human body. There are different types of stem cells. Um, so we all know that every human being starts by the combination of an oocyte and a sperm, and they are together forming the first cell <coughs> that then eventually leads to the um, generation of entire human being, which is very, very much insane since um, this one cell determines all the other cells of the human body. And uh, the cell then forms copies of itself, which then form um, this human fetus at some point. And if you take from these, the inner cell mass in a very early stage, so meaning at like um, 16 cell stage, um, you take these cells from the inner cell mass and you call, these cells are then called pluripotent stem cells. And they're depicted here. Um, in blue. And they have the potential to, to, to generate cells, for example, for the circulatory system, for the nervous system, for the immune system, um, but all the other tissues uh, in the human body. But we do not work with embryonic stem cells because we cannot get them, because that would mean that we ha would have to disrupt a human embryo, which is morally and ethically not possible. Therefore, we're very, very happy that a new technique was developed um, like 10 years ago, uh, which we can apply now. And it is really, really um, nicely to depict as this uh, mountain where you have a marble on top, which still has the option to go down on all different ways downhill. And um, if the marble decides in the first height to turn right or left, um, it rolls down to different part points in the valley. So if 
this specific marble you can see here on top um, rolls down rather to the right, um, you would it would become a liver cell. But if it randomly rolls down to the other side, then you would have a skin cell. All of these cells that ultimately reach the lowest point, like a valley or something, um, are different kinds of cells. And normally, cellular development, what we call it, would be the process of rolling down the hill, is a one-way street. That means the cells that then are in the valley, they, are, they cannot be returned uphill in order to make them re-choose their direction to develop. But there is a technique that makes this possible, and that's where we get induced pluripotent stem cells. So there is this person that stands down the hill, that put, that's a metaphoric person, that puts a lot of pressure onto this skin cell in order to roll it uphill and give it back its potency to generate all the other cells, not only a skin cell. And that's what we are applying in this technique. So what are iPSCs? iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, are generated from mostly skin cells by the use of this power that I just depicted with the strong person on rolling up the marble the mount, uphill the mountain. And um, the cells you get from these skin cells is induced pluripotent stem cells that then can be made into all the different cell types in the human body. And this technique is extremely extraordinary, and therefore uh, the scientist who developed it, Shinya Yamanaka, a, ja a Japanese um, researcher, uh, got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2012 for developing that somatic cells, like skin cells, can be re reprogrammed to become pluripotent. Um, I think this technique is very much remarkable, and. I'm a big fan of the technique per se, and so I'll show you the application, how we use it, um, in order to make you see what the benefit is. So when we get skin cells, in this case, we have uh, skin cells in, uh, on the day one, you can see normal skin cells from a patient, a poor patient, in culture, meaning in a Petri dish. That's what you see here. Um, then you, four times, in a four, on four consecutive days, you add this force that I mentioned, and you, um, you induce the cells to develop towards um, pluripotency, meaning that you see these, at day seven, you see, coming, you see these colonies clustering together, um, and they can develop a very different shape and, and at day 10, you see that these colonies become even bigger, and you can transfer them to a new Petri dish, um, specifically without the underlying skin cells. And then if you continue having them in a Petri dish, they might eventually look like the cell on day 30, which is a cluster of more, a lot of induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is not only one cell. Mm. So this technique is very nice, and it functions even for poorer skin cells, which is, which is very good. So right now, we, have, we can take skin cells from a patient, make them stem cells, and then the idea is to make them brain cells again. So we can see the process of a stem cell developing the brain cell with the genetic background of a Pura syndrome patient. So we would do this for the Pura patient skin cells, make them iPSCs, and we would do the same process for healthy cells, healthy skin cells, make them iPSCs. Then we would differentiate, as we call it, so we would make them or press them so they become neurons or uh, neuronal progenitor cells or something like this, like brain cells. Um, 
and compare their development towards neurons or other brain cells to healthy cells, to healthy donor cells. Um, and this comparison then gives us an slight, or can give us an, uh, an insight on how the disease mechanism works. Um, that would mean, like for example, you see that uh, until in if you if you differentiate them towards uh, brain development or d towards neurons, and you see that after four days we can see a change, we can kind of see okay what else is affected, and then um, we can conclude by this okay so this must be the point where Pura plays the critical role, and that's why. Uh, or that is one of the reasons why we see um, the clinical output. So that's really interesting. And also in a Petri dish, for example, we could for sure test therapeutic compounds. So in order to see if, if we give the cells this or that compound, it makes the situation better or the neurons can develop better. Um, since the genetic background of a healthy donor or a healthy individual compared to a patient is very much different, it will be tough to compare those two cells during differentiation towards brain cells because we don't know what the effect of the other genetic background is. So we need ideally matched genetic backgrounds um, of the patient and the control cell line uh, in order to compare them during development because neuronal development in healthy, even in healthy people, can be different, meaning that we would need the same genetic background to actually see what PURA as a gene does. So when we take patient stem cells and repair PURA, PURA gene to have two functional PURA copies, that would be a so-called isogenic control. That means the genetic background is the exact same apart from that the patient cells have the mutation or the deletion or whatever in the PURA gene, whereas the isogenic control doesn't have that, but a functional PURA gene in both copies. And then if we compare that, we hope to see that the exact difference that the mutated pro in poor alpha or poor gene and then poor, poor, alpha, poor alpha protein causes. That is, that would be the ideal case. In order to generate these controls, um, we use uh, a tool that's very well, very, very well known now nowadays and a lot, a lot discussed, um, which is called CRISPR-Cas9, and it's a it's a system uh, that specifically targets um, uh, one defined location on the DNA um, and cuts there in order to slice in the correct, correct copy of Pura gene. Um, as, you, as Dirk already introduced, uh, if you print out the human uh, DNA or genome, you, um, it would be a huge collection of folders with uh, different uh, information saved in the human genome, and poor, poor alpha, or pura, the gene, would be, uh, only, would be a single page in the book, whereas the mutation would only be a single letter on this page in all of these books. So this, is, this tool to modify the DNA um, would have to be very, very specific in order to target just this single spot. And I will just, I would just like to uh, remind you that all these letters are just composed of four different letters, so it's just A, T, G, C, meaning the variation is not too high because it's only four different letters. So the tool must be extremely specific to find the right spot to cut. And CRISPR-Cas is actually really specific. So it, um, 
the system is composed of the Cas9 prote protein that you can see in the background in, in light, light blue, and either one or two uh, RNAs that are called guide R that is called guide RNA. So the combination of CR and tracer RNA is called guide RNA, and that you can see in green and red. Um, and this RNA targets a specific spot on the DNA that is depicted in blue, and Cas9, the protein, then cuts the specific spot if the combination, the complex of RNA and DNA uh, and protein have found the right spot in the DNA. And that's what you see with the scissors here. So then you introduce a cut and you can paste in um, the correct sequence of the Pura gene in this case. This seems really easy, which it is not. Um, the right insertion is very tricky. Also, finding the right spot for the system is very tricky and a huge safety risk, actually, if you think of, application of, the, of the application of CRISPR-Cas in the, in the human system. So it, um, if, you, if you think about the system cutting at a different spot that is not um, the one that you're targeting, you could fairly easily cut regions in the DNA that are very, very important and that way generate even uh, cells that have different problems from the Pura syndrome, but like newly generate problems. Because for example, if you cut a tumor suppressor gene and then it is impaired, and um, that might lead to the, fa to the case that uh, cancer cells evolve from these newly edited cells. And also other regions of the DNA are really, really crucial. And if you edit them accidentally, it's really bad. But for our research purposes and generating this mentioned control, isogenic control line, this system is ideal. So what are the future goals? If we have the system built up, we have our Pura stem cells, iPS cells, and we have healthy cells, either being cells from healthy donors or healthy control cells, or repaired Pura cells. That would be the mentioned isogenic control. If, when we have this in place, we can see differences in brain cell development, depicted here with stem cells becoming brain cells. Um, and we can see the process, and we can, we can follow the process in the Petri dish, and we can see where changes occur. Um, where, and then also we can ana analyze interaction partners and maybe find out through the mutation in the affected pura cells um, what interaction partners are not there anymore or what interaction partners might be additionally there and so on. And this eventually should lead to ideas on the mechanism what is happening in poor cells compared to healthy cells, and ultimately lead to ideas for treatment. As a take home message, I wanted to focus, so specifically, what can we do with iPSCs? I've been talking about that a little now, but specifically, as I said, we want to use iPSCs in order to generate a disease model that is very accurate since it's in the human system, but in the Petri dish. Um, and we could potentially do drug discovery on these cells in the Petri dish. What we cannot do with iPSCs up to date, we cannot use them for therapy and specifically not for therapy in the brain. And me personally, I don't see that coming in the near future because that would mean implanting a pluripotent cell into the stem of the brain. Um, and these cells replicate a lot. That would mean you put something like a cell that is as capable as a cancer cell in replicating or even more capable into the middle of the brain. Um, this is 
definitely something we don't see in the near future. Um, and what can we do with CRISPR-Cas? I, I mean, CRISPR-Cas is a lot in the media nowadays, and um, I think it's a very powerful tool right now for research, and we can use it very nicely, as I introduced to you, for generating controls, like these controls that are that have the same genetic background, but a repaired poorer cop two repaired or two functional poorer copies, one repaired one. And um, we can use that as a comparison very, very nicely. And I think it's, it's, it's a very nice tool for that. But we definitely, right now, cannot use CRISPR-Cas as a clinical method to repair genes. Um, this is due to the fact that uh, that I mentioned to you that it might cut at different spots because it's very special, it's very specific to one location on the genome, but just very and not 100%. And there is the problem. If just one other spot is modified, this can lead to tremendous problems. And before we know that, we cannot, use, we cannot even think about using CRISPR in a clinical setup. Um, additionally, the problem is, that in brain cells, it's even more tricky to use CRISPR-Cas because that would mean that you would either have to treat in the brain um, without any security checkups of the cells that you modify, or it would mean that you would have to take out the brain cells, modify them, check them if they have any additional edits, and then would have to put them back. And this is not possible. You cannot take cells out of the brain. Therefore, the application of CRISPR-Cas in a clinical setup is not going to be there for the brain, at least, in the near future. With this, I would like to uh, close and thank all the people that are involved in this study. Um, very much I would like to thank the Niesing Lab. Um, it's wonderful to work there. Um, the picture kind of shows us sh all shooting at Dirk, which is kind of funny. Um, and it's great working there. It, Marcel, who's also here, um, uh, is working on more of the structural stuff. I mean, Dirk, you already heard before. He is uh, he's a great supervisor. He's, uh, he's putting a lot of emphasis onto, into this work. And um, it's just a very, very nice environment to work. Um, additionally, I would like to thank the IPS core unit at the Helmholtz Center in Munich, uh, which is led by Michael Drucker and um, which also uh, contributes a lot to the project. Um, specifically, Iona Rusha, who's uh, working eagerly on the cell with me. Thank you very much, and I am happy to answer questions. <laughs>